that again we give you all one more time. You are Alpha. You are Alpha and Omega. Sing to him today. He's the beginning and the end. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to We give you all you all. Hey! We give you you all. Let's sing it together one more time. Sing it like you mean it today. Sing it to him. Give you all, all the glory. We give you all the glory. For you are good, Lord. Worship the Lord some praise today. Amen. Give the Lord some praise. He's worthy. He's worthy to be praised. Draw me close to you. I feel like singing today. Y'all sing with me. Never let me go. Never let me go. Yes, God. No one else can take your place. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. To hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. You are my desire. No one else will do. No one else will do. No one else can take your place.
to hear you say, to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way. Bring me back to you. You're all I want. Let's just sing it one time. You're all I want. You're all I need. You're all I ever need. You're all I want. Help me know that you are near. be close to him. Today, I just want to have the opportunity, I have the privilege today to introduce to you today my friend and colleague, um, Pastor Denry White. Um, Pastor White is a native of the New York City. New York from New York City, New York. I'm sorry. He has been married to the lovely Carla Smart formerly Carla Smart, now Carla White, and we wave your hand, Sister White, if you can. Amen. They've been married for 13 years and counting. Amen, amen. 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 <laughs> they have three lovely children together, um, Nathaniel, Daniel, and their daughter, Isabel. Amen. He was able to get that little girl, amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, they also have one daughter who is waiting for the resurrection day. Danae is her name. He currently pastors the Kalamazoo Trinity Temple Church in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And he also pastors the, the um, Berean Creek, I'm sorry, Battle Berean Creek SDA Church. Battle Creek, that was a typo there, all right. Battle Creek um, SDA Church and Pastor White. Um, so he pastors two churches. He completed his bachelor um, degree in ministerial theology at Oakwood University and re received his master's of divinity degree from Andrews Theological Seminary at Andrews University. Pastor White's ministerial desire is to restore families to Christ by making them disciples of Christ. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. He loves to minister to high school and junior high school students concerning spiritual life educational plans, career choices, and Christ-centered relationships. Pastor White's favorite um, verse demonstrates to us God's ultimate desire. God's ultimate desire is us. Revelation 21.3, um, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He believes that day will be a great family reunion, and he desires that we all be there, where we are all invited through the mercy of God. I've known Pastor White since my days at Oakwood University. It's been almost 20 years since I left Oakwood. Have mercy, Lord. But anyway, um, <laughs> and we've been friends from then, and even from then, I've known this about Pastor White, that he loves the Lord, he loves young people. And he loves his family. Amen. He, is, he has a great sense of humor. Um, he truly loves the Lord, like I said. Um, he's very passionate about ministry. And so today, I know that we will be blessed by his ministry of the word today. And so I want to ask that you would open your hearts, prepare to receive the message that God has for us through his manservant after the choir sings our song of meditation. Amen. Amen.
It is a true privilege and honor to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. To be amongst those who are alive. In these uncertain days, it is truly a blessing to be seen and not viewed. But while we say that, there are many who call out and call out broken and brokenness and say, Lord, it may be better for me to be viewed because I'm not being seen. I know there's individuals who came here today in a broken spirit, a broken heart, broken mind, wounded from whether it's family friends, work, are wounded even from themselves. Someone came here today, damaged. Someone came here today looking for a savior, looking for a healer, looking for one to restore them. And now that person may not be the person who was baptized recently, that individual may be someone who's been here for 30, 40, 50 years. Just because you've been here in longevity does not mean that you are, 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 are shielded from being wounded. And I pray that today, that today, when? 
today that you would receive deliverance, whether it's from the song, whether it's from the scripture, whether it's from the prayer, and maybe even from the word of God. Maybe it's a handshake or a warm hug, but that the spirit will speak to you today and restore you back to him. You didn't come here to have fun. You didn't come here for a political agenda. You came here to receive of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you sit at his feet today and leave healed. Healed complete. Healed. Restored. I pray that when you leave here today, you are so filled that you got to tell somebody that there's a Savior in town. Oh, I wish I had two more amens in this place today. It is a truly an honor to always be in the house of the Lord. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I'm truly thankful for my brother and friend, my colleague, Pastor Reed. He's truly a man of God. He truly loves the Lord. He loves his church. Amen. He truly loves you. And God has put in his heart to lead you on a path that of righteousness. I'm asking that you encourage him and lift him up. I'm not going to joke on him today. I'll do that another day. But it's truly an honor to be once again in the house of the Lord. Amen. I just want to say something personal before we get into God's word. I want to thank you, Stratford, for the opportunity about seven years ago when I first came to the seminary. Uh, Pastor Reed opened up the doors again when you were at the other location, the opportunity to preach uh, here at this church. And I want to thank you for, for that. Uh, you may have been part of the reason why I'm now pastoring. And so I want to thank you openly and publicly to your pastor and you for taking the opportunity to believe into a young preacher who was crazy enough to say that Jesus called him out of darkness. Amen? Amen. I'm so thankful for my wonderful, beautiful wife and children who are here with me. Won't you stand with me if you don't mind? I know you like to do spiritual exercise, but when it comes to physical exercise, you might want to stay comfortable. But we do preach the health message still. Amen? Amen. Amen, amen. So why don't we do a little physical exercise and reread re uh, Luke chapter 14. It's only a few verses, not the old chapter. Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse 25. That's the gospel of Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse 25. And it reads, Now great multitudes went with him. And he turned and said to them, you know, you can read too. I don't matter what translation you is. I believe the power of God's word is in it. Amen? Amen. Let's read 25 again. Now great multitudes went with him. And he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, also he cannot what? Be my disciple, verse 27. And whoever does not bear his cross, come after me. He cannot be my what? Cannot be my disciple. Amen. My objective today is to transform you or to help in the transforming process from member to disciple. Amen. See, members come to a country club to have fun. Amen. Disciples come to a life of sacrifice for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, so our duty today is to help you to become from, to leave from being a member of this church to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Won't you pray with me? Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. We, your people, are listening. Transform our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. A young man was eager, was eager to give his life to Jesus Christ and to go out in the mission field and start to do all these wonderful things for Christ. So he took out a piece of paper, took out a, take out a piece of paper with me, if you don't mind. Take out a piece of paper in your mind. Imagination, imagination, imagination. <laughs> don't take out a real paper. Take that on tonight. Tonight you could do that. Take out a piece of paper and you begin writing 
all the things that he's willing to do for God. I'm willing to go here. I'm willing to go here, but I'm not going to go here. I'm not going to go there. I'm willing to wear this. I'm willing to wear this, but I'm not going to wear that. I'm not going to do this. I'm willing to do this, and I'm willing to do that, but I won't do this. Then he finished his list, felt proud, and said, I'm going to church now. I'm going to put it at the altar. I'm going to put it at the altar. And when he's in church, he just felt grieved. Something is wrong. And he took the paper, he crumbled it up. He went again that night, and he started writing. He started writing. Come on, write with me. He said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. But he just still was not happy. Something was wrong. So he said, I'm going to go to the preacher. Point to the preacher. I'm going to go to the pastor. He went to the pastor. He said, Pastor Reed. This is imagination now. Pastor Reed, I want to do all these things for Christ. But somehow I am not happy. I'm not excited. Pastor Reed takes the paper. Pastor Reed looks at the, look it over. Then Pastor Reed takes a blank sheet of paper and says, I want you to do this. Write your name at the bottom of this paper. He writes his name at the bottom of the paper and he says, now put it on the altar. And the young man went and he put it on the altar and finally he felt joy. God is not concerned about what you can do for him. Rather, God is concerned about how much of you are you going to willing to give him. God is not concerned about you know, what you can contribute to his ministry. Yeah. God is concerned about are you willing to give your whole life yeah. to him? Yeah. So today I want to speak to you on simply the subject. Let me go. Let it go. Let it go. Let you, yourself, everything, let it what? Go. Let it go. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 21, as we look at the time that we are in, we are not just on the toenails of Earth's history, we are at the close of Earth's history. If you didn't believe this, any other year, 2007 should put you on alert. You know, when this country is, is being threatened, it goes from different colors. It goes from different colors. And, and the most severe one is what? Red alert. As Christians, when you read what I'm about to read with you, you should put your mind on red alert. Turn with me to Luke chapter 21, the gospel of Luke. We're going to stay in the book of Luke today. If you don't mind walking to the scriptures with me, Luke chapter 21, beginning at verse 25. Luke 21, beginning at verse 25. Now, what I'm about to share with you, you are thinking that you are listening to CNN or watching Fox News. Or MSNBC, you maybe you want to be mutual. Whatever the case may be, right? You are you think that you are watching or listening to NPR. Here we go, Luke chapter 21, verse 25. Tell me it does not this sound recent. And there will be what? Signs in what? The sun. And in the what? What happened about two months ago? Total eclipse. Amen. In the stars and the earth. Distress between what? Nations. Distress between what? Nations. It smells like we are about to go into war. While we are already in our, our hundreds of wars. We, we have a whole bunch of wars going on right now, but it smells like we're about to go into a real big war. There will be perplexity. The sea and the waves, What? How many major storms did we just have in the space of two months? Houston has been overthrown. Florida has been dethroned. Puerto Rico is... Other, other islands have been really washed away. Now continue to listen, verse 26. Men's heart failing them from what? Fear of the what? Expectation of those things which come upon the earth. My wife was uh, uh, reading to me an article yesterday. Another individual just collapsed out of nowhere. Sudden heart attack. People are dropping like flies. They're just having heart attacks, strokes out of nowhere. Because people are traumatized from what's going on in this world. 
Many more and more people are dropping dead. Young people, old people. There was a young man when I was, uh, uh, we were living in, in uh, Waukegan, right above Waukegan. He was 21 years old, actually 19 years old, playing basketball, ran up to, uh, to make a, lay, a layup, dropped dead. People's hearts are failing them because of the fears of the things that are going on in the world. Stress is killing us. There's more though. Verse 27, and when we see, though, here's the, always the hope. Yes. When we look at these things, when we look at CNN and Fox, all we see is misery. You know, for years, I didn't watch the news. For years, I wasn't watching the news. And not until recently, I've been watching the news. Ever since Trump became president, I said, let me keep my eyes on the news. <laughs> and one of the worst things I've ever done, it's the worst thing I've ever done. My blood pressure has gone up. I'm starting to eat more. I'm starting to worry because what? The fear of what's going on in this world. But those of us who have our eyes on Jesus Christ, verse 27 and 28 says, Then they will see what? The Son of Man what? Coming in what? The cloud with what? Power and what? Great glory. Now look at verse 27. What does verse 27 say? When you see these things happen, don't fear. Don't go hiding. Don't go running. Don't get caught up into the confusion. Rather do what? Look up and lift up what? Your heads because what's coming? Oh, come on. You could do better than that. What does the word of God say? Look up. Right? Lift up your heads. Why? Because your redemption draws near. Oh, I wish I had three more amens than that. Look at the word of God. It says, look up, lift your heads up because your redemption draws near. Rather than that, basically saying, stay alert. Yes. When you see these things happen, don't panic like the rest of the world, wondering what's going on. Rather, look up, lift your head up, and start celebrating because your redemption has drawn near. I know you don't believe me, so you need more evidence. Look with me now to verse 36. Verse 36 is very usual. It says, watch therefore and pray what? Always. Now and then? Always. A few times? Always. No, pray what? Always. Always. Why? That you may what? Be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and be able to stand before the Son of Man. See, you thought we were just going to start celebrating before I start dissecting you. You thought we were just going to start celebrating. Oh, it's going to be one of those second coming sermons. We're just going to celebrate. Before we celebrate, the time will come. We need to dissect. There are some things that are in us. Look what the scripture says, verse 26. It says, watch. When we look at this word watch, we're thinking, oh, just watch the signs. But can I ask you a question? Can the signs save you? No. The signs themselves are to keep you alert, let you know what's going on. It's to keep you from danger. When you're driving down the street, you see a stop sign. It means what? Stop. You're driving down the street, it says a heel sign. It means what? So when you see the signs, there's a message behind it to what? Save your life. But the signs themselves cannot do what? Jesus asks, tells us to watch. And this word watch does not mean watch the signs. Rather, it means take an account. Take what? Take an account of your life. See, while you're watching the signs, you could drop dead right now. So this is why the signs cannot save you. But when you take an account for your life, when I wake up in the morning and I seek the Lord, I'm asking for his what? Guidance throughout the day. The middle of the day, I stop and say, Lord, have I been living in your will all day? And then finally, at nighttime, Lord, forgive me for where I've gone astray. You are taking what? An account to your life. 
Then when you study the Word of God, we see many of us, we love to study God's Word, and we love to read, we love to read the blessings. We love the encouraging words. We like the encouraging devotionals. You know, we have our, our special certain evangelist, our certain uh, uh, our writer that we love to go to. We like our motivational speeches. But when we read God's word, it's supposed to prick our hearts. There is something wrong God is pointing out to you. That we're discussing this in Sabbath school, that when the Holy Spirit moves on your life, he will point out to you things in your life that he needs to get rid of. Notice what I said. I didn't say you need to get rid of. Because you don't want to. Let's be honest with ourselves, choir. When's the last time you want to get rid of a good cherished sin? When is the last time that good feeling that you like doing that wrong thing you want to get rid of? If you can be honest with yourself, you would not want God to move anything in your life. You want God to be like this. You just want God to come by and visit your house. God, you can stay in the back room. But after breakfast tomorrow, you might want to go on, keep, keep going. But God is not interested in visiting your house. In Revelation 3, he does not say, oh, I'm, I'm knocking at the door so I can just come and visit. No. When God is coming into your house, he's coming to take ownership. He wants not just the, the keys, he wants also the deed of your house. He becomes now the new manager, the new owner of your life. Matter of fact, the garden belongs to him. The car belongs to him. The food in the refrigerator belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. Except you. You see, my wife and I were driving down here. When we were driving down this morning, we, I don't know if you notice. Is nature looking less and less attractive lately? It's not, it's not as vibrant and beautiful as it used to be. I, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's my illusion. But take a run. Look, look at it. Look at it. I know it's that season, but look even at summertime. Nature is not as vibrant as it used to be. As a matter of fact, my wife, she's the smartest one in the house. She brought to my attention, do you know that they have to put extra nutrients in the soil for, for, for plants to grow? Because nature is just losing its essence. It's, it's not as vibrant as it used to be. Do you know that Romans chapter 8 tells us, God, that Paul tells us that even creation is beckoning God to return. It's calling for God to return. Everything is calling for God to return except Can I be honest with you? I drove two and a half hours, so I'm not going to take 20 minutes. But I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, be respectful of time, so hopefully I can come back. So hopefully I can come back. But we did drive about two and a half hours, all right? So I'm going to be respectful of the time, but I'm, you might take a little longer, I made a list, or however the spirit leads. But can I be honest with you? Can you be honest with yourself? Do you really want Jesus to come? Some of you have stocks. Some of you have life dreams that you want to accomplish. You hear my daughter pr prayed, Lord, we have dreams. You heard her pray. She said, uh, you know, we have dreams. We have, there's things that we want to accomplish. Some of you single person, some single people in here look forward to that wedding day. We want to accomplish that. Some of you seniors have a bucket list of things you want to accomplish. Do you really want Jesus to come and interrupt your accomplishments? Talk to me. Be honest with yourself. If Jesus were to come right now, some of you would be grieved. Lord, I had a vacation next year I wanted to take. Lord, I was just about to get married. 
Lord, there's things I want to accomplish. But Jesus says, watch and pray always. Take an account of yourself daily. Realize that your condition is not good. That you need a savior. You are hopeless right now. You're hopeless. We are hopeless right now. Our mind is bent to go ahead and achieve the best. But Jesus says, look, look, look. I am coming and I want to take you with me. But there is a one major problem that we have. And that one problem is you. You refuse to let me in and allow me to stay. And see, unfortunately, some of us have let Jesus in. But then our sins keep kicking him out. These signs do not save us. This is why we are to watch, take an account of what's going on. When we see these signs, they should trigger us. Look, I need to make sure that I am ready. I need to make sure that I am ready. Can I share something personal? I don't really know him. I've never met him. But my great-grandfather, my great-grandfather was... Let's just put it out there. He was a uh, slightly European Jamaican, if you want to put it that way. And he, you know, he was, he just loved the island ladies. He just loved the island ladies. And he had this particular, he had a particular um, assignment, you know, that day he was part of the ship crew. And he was supposed to be at the dock at a certain time. But he was in love with the island ladies. He just wouldn't let this particular one go. And it was morning time, early, early in the morning time, and they are doing things that they're not supposed to do because they're not married, right? And he realized the time is at hand. And he runs, he runs, he runs to the dock. He runs to the dock. But when he gets there, he misses the boat. He misses the boat. I think I've stressed it enough to you. So let me give you some hope and some clarity. We are to be on red alert, red alert when we see these signs. We are to watch and take account of our selves. Here's an example. You say, Pastor, well, we're preacher, here's an example. Give us an example. Give us an example of somebody who took account for themselves. Remember I said we're going to stay in Luke. The book of what? Luke, Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23, just a few verses over, Luke chapter 23. I want to give you an example of two individuals that were in the same predicament, same predicament. None was righteous, more righteous than the other. They were in the same predicament. But look at the difference here, Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 39. Luke chapter 23, the beginning at verse 39. And the word of God said what? Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying what? If you are the Christ, do what? Save yourself and us. Okay? This guy, being a criminal, begins mocking and blaspheming against Christ. He is a criminal. He's a thief, a scoundrel, a, a murderer. He's, a, he, he's been charged, and now he's about to be executed. And instead of looking to Christ and calling on Christ and pleading to Christ, he begins mocking Christ. And then he has the nerve to equate himself with Christ because he says, save yourself and us also. But look at this guy, and I pray that we be more like this guy, this next person. And if ladies in the house, be like this lady, okay? If you wouldn't want to put it in whatever gender you want. But here is the example, verse 40. But the other, I love the word but in the Bible. 
It's a conjunction, right? Meaning that whatever was before has been negated, all right? It's not even important anymore. So there's no more importance in verse 39. Verse 40 on is where the importance stands. But the what? Other answered, rebuking him, says, do you not fear God? Basically, check yourself. Check yourself. We deserve to be punished. We are condemned. We are sinful. But what? This man has done what? Nothing wrong. This man has done what? Nothing wrong. The lesson we can learn from the thief on the cross, I know how we love to use the thief on the cross. We like to re go right to the part, fast forward to the part. Remember me when what? We know it by heart. Remember me when you come into your what? Kingdom. Kingdom. We love to use that part. But we forget verse 40 and, first, and, and, and 41. We deserve this punishment. We are sinners. If, if Pastor Reed was really, really, as we were really transparent that we were supposed to be as ministers, I would have asked him to put on the bio, Denry White, a sinner. And if you want to pretty it up, who needs a savior? We, he recognized, we are sinful. I am messed up. I, no matter how much I have done right, I am still messed up. We are sinners. And then he points to Jesus. But you are righteous. You are righteous. You see, when you take an account for yourself, it's like you're looking into the mirror. The commandments is described many times as being the mirror. If it's the mirror. We look in the mirror and we see things. Like I looked in the mirror this morning, right, and I checked myself out. I said, okay, this needs to be fixed. This needs, I need to fix this. I wish I had a mirror now. Maybe I could fix my bow tie, right? We look in the mirror to check ourselves. The Word of God is God's mirror to us. When we go to the Word of God, all 66 book, it's a check to us that there are things in our life that's not right. We are not ready to go out. So the same way you check your mirror in your house to see how beautiful you are, to make sure you are just right, the same way you need to check this mirror, the spiritual mirror in the morning time, at noon time, and at night time to make sure that you are right. Oh, I wish I had a few more amens than that. When we check the mirror, it tells us this is wrong. And so we need to go to the mirror each day. This young man looked at Jesus. And Jesus was his mirror. And he realized, I am worthless. Some call me thief. Some call me criminal. But you can put your own identity in there. There are some of us in here. That can, we've been living by a label. We have a label because of our sin. Somebody in here is a thief. Somebody in here, can I be honest? May have raped somebody. Somebody in here may have murdered somebody. Like she said, maybe not physically, but emotionally. Maybe, we, maybe you weren't raped physically. But you are raped emotionally and mentally. But regardless, everyone in here is a sinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every last one. But the difference between the first thief, who is a sinner, and the second thief, who was a sinner, the first thief didn't look at Jesus as his hope. But the second thief realized that Jesus was his only hope. Only hope. 
When I was 10 years old, my oldest son is 10 now, I just learned how to swim, Pastor. And, you know, when you just learn how to swim, now, you, you know, at 10 years old, Theo, you know, you, you just excited. You think you, you know, you think you're the man. You think you're, you're just the stuff now. And we went on this church picnic. And, and I had a, a girlfriend at the time. My wife is on that side of the room. I'm not going to look on that side of the room. I had a girlfriend at the time, right? And, 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 and oh, everybody is, is jumping off the diving board. Everyone is, you know, showing, showboating. And I have, I've never jumped off the diving board before. I just learned how to swim, right? And so I'm like, well, I, I know how to swim. I, I, I could do it. And my girlfriend, she's in the water. Right. And she's swimming. She's swimming around. Right. And, and it just that day, you know, you know how it is in your mind. She just looked brighter like like this, this all around her. Like I just had to prove myself that day. Right. And so I get on top of the thing. I get on there and I'm scared. Oh, I was trembling inside and outside. But I but I saw her. I had to I had to prove myself. I jumped off. I didn't dive off, Theo. I jumped off. Next thing I know, there were more water than air. And no matter what I was doing, I was hopeless. No matter what I was doing, I was hopeless. All my techniques of swimming went out in the room. I can't remember anything. And I thought that was it. Until... My only hope, a lifeguard, reached onto me, snatched me out of that water, pulled me and said to me in my ears, I got you. Pulled me out of that water. And I was, I, I was not even concerned about him being embarrassed. I was just glad to be alive. Jesus saw us. Sinking deep in sin. Far from the peaceful shore. And Jesus says, look, I'm not going to stay here and tell him he needs to come out. No, 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 no. I'm going to go down in the water. Get wet. Get dirty. Get filthy. And I'm going to snatch them out. Oh, I thank God. That just like the thief said, remember me. I would say that God that said, God said, I got your back. Yeah, yeah. That thief yelled out to Jesus, remember me. Yeah. And Jesus said, I got your back. Yeah, yeah. I got you. I know many of you in this room. You remember that day. You can't even remember what year it was, but you just knew when you were sinking deep in sin. There was no hope. The alcohol didn't taste the same no more. The drugs couldn't do it no more. The smoking, the weed, it couldn't do it no more. The sex, the anything else, it just couldn't do it no more. But you felt yourself hopeless, and you called upon Jesus, and you said, remember me. And Jesus snatched you out of darkness. And I look at you, you look pretty, you look handsome. Snatched out of darkness. Oh, what a blessed Savior he is. What a blessed Savior he is. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Let me continue. Let me close out. Let me continue. So my last point. So first, we need to be alert. We need to be what? Alert. alert. When you see the signs... It's a message. It's a message of what's coming up. When you are driving on the highway 94 or whatever, the interstate, and you see the signs, know that it's what? Coming up. And we were told what? Look up. Lift your head. Why? Your redemption what? Draws nigh. So you should be excited. And in your excitement, you should be doing what? Two, take an account of yourself. How do I do this, preacher? Simply this. Every single day, go to God and say, God, is there something in me that is not pleasing you? Lord, 
Is there something? Show me what it is and give me the strength to let it go. Give me the strength, the power to let it go. God, you know me. I, won't, I don't even want to let it go. So God, break it off of me. Take it away from me. Remove it. Because the third and final one is abandon. Abandon. First, be alert. Then take an account. And when God points these things to you in your life, abandon. Abandon. What are you talking about, preacher? Luke chapter 14, our scripture, as we're coming close to a close. Luke chapter 14, our scripture. Look what it says. Now it's going to get really quiet in here. Really quiet. Luke chapter 14, our scripture. Now, the thing I love with Jesus, Jesus is a very unique person. Now, I know there's some seminaries in here and pastors here. If I start a church, right, or even just have a church and, you know, 200 people are behind me, 300 million, I mean, not million, thousands of people. You know, one time Jesus fed, what, 5,000 men, right? But it didn't account for the ladies and children. So we can average that to about 9,000, maybe 10,000 people. Even in John, the book of John, Jesus did this, and, and uh, Luke doesn't give the, this a full account. But as many times Jesus would have a crowd following him. And unlike us human leaders like Pastor Reed, myself, and Pastor um, Louis Jun, did I say it right? Probably said it wrong, right? <laughs> Pastor with the flowerful tie over here, right? <laughs> that's my brother, that's my brother. Many of us would be glad to have a hundred plus. Two hundred, give us a thousand, what? A mega church style, Adventist mega church, what? <laughs> we would be bragging about this. You know, we wouldn't even take pastor no more. Give me bishop. <laughs> Got about 10 seminarians onto me. Three other pastors. This bishop just walk into the room and just sing anytime. Did I call him out? <laughs> I told you I was going to get him, did I? I tell you, I tell you. <laughs> anyway, no, I'm messing with him, man. I was messing with you, man. I'm messing with him. I love this guy, man. I love this guy. Any of us, think about it, even in your business, even in your business, your corporate business, whatever, you would love to have all these clients if you own your own business, all these, these people working for you, all this, all this coming in. Jesus has a funny way of doing things, a weird way. He's walking, the Bible says, verse 25. He's walking. Then he does what? Turns around, sees the crowd, and looks what he tells them. Basically, get away. Look what he tells them. 26, if anyone comes to me and does not what? From we're little children, we've been told Jesus loves the little ones. We've been told to love one another. Beloved, let us love one another. Look what Jesus does. Confuses the massive. He says what? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, and if you're a lady, her husband, and children... Are you, the children too? <laughs> brothers and sisters. Okay, I can understand brothers and sisters sometimes. <laughs> but children and mother, especially in the black community, yeah. mom, you want me to hate mom? Are you serious? And the little father I got, if I got daddy, you want me to hate daddy? But Jesus says, look, 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 look. Brothers, sisters, yes. Just in case you got it twisted and thought he was like joking around. He said, yes. And you what? His own what? Life. You cannot. Now, I've told my kids there's no such word as can't. You know, they'd be riding the bike, the bicycle. Daddy, I can't. I can't. I, I, I can't pedal. Or, or they'd, be, they'd be doing this. Daddy, I can't. I said, there's no such word as can't. And they do it. 
Because they tricked the mind. But when Jesus says, you can't, oh, this is not a question or a discussion. This is a preacher, where's the preacher said? Deductive. This is a declaration that there is no other option besides what I just said to you. You cannot be my what? Notice he didn't say be my member. Be my what? Disciple. A disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ. Will do anything for him. Watch the martial arts movies, the kung fu movies. You'll see what I'm talking about. They would do anything for their, 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 their teacher. Whatever he tells them to do, they'll do it. Jesus said, if you don't willing to hate everybody else, including your life, you cannot, cannot be my disciple. So, pastor, what are you preaching? What are you trying to say? Should I go around now and tell my wife, look, Packing my bags. I've chosen Jesus. I'm done with you. Or tell my children, well, you're on your own now. Go and fend with yourself. My brothers and sisters, I never liked you anyway. I remember when I was 12 and you stole my Twinkie. I've, now what Jesus told me, hate you and everybody else. Call my mother. Remember that time you put me in my room and told me to go in my room because my brother did something? I hate you too. And father, daddy, I definitely hate you. All them years of whooping you've given me, I hate you. Is that what Jesus is telling us? No. The word Greek in the Greek here, hate, is referring to loyalty. Loyalty. Who is number one in your life? When you got to make a decision, are you going to listen to God or are you going to listen to mommy? Are you going to listen to God or are you going to listen to daddy? Are you going to listen to God or are you going to listen to your wife? Now, my wife, now I believe this. I know I'm taking my time. I'm sorry. I'm not going to take any more time. I really believe this is not, Paul says, you hear Paul talk sometimes. Paul says stuff like, this is what God said, but this is just me. And he said, don't take it, you know, for word. He said, Paul says stuff like that. This is just me. This is just me. I believe in Genesis chapter 3, 2, actually 2 rather, when God was making a um, uh, woman, Eve, right, he intentionally put Adam to sleep. One, so that Adam would have no say in what he's about to do. Okay? Then second... To give women all the secrets to life answers. <laughs> Pastor Reed, anyone who's been married to a spiritual woman, okay, you know what I said, a spiritual lady, a spiritual wife, I cannot tell you the last time I was right. <laughs> I cannot tell you the last time I was right. If there was possibly a time I was right, it's probably in the negatives right now. Because I've been wrong so many times in comparison to her view, I'm, I mean, it doesn't even matter. But God says, look, even though your wife has been right all these times, if I tell you something and it's contrary to what she says, where is your loyalty? Where is your loyalty? Who is number one in your life? The first commandment is not God saying, hey, it's a buffet line. Choose me first, and then you can have everything else. No, no, no. The first commandment is God saying, look, there is no other option. No other option. Don't put your wife in front of me. Don't even put your children in front of me. Nothing in front of me. In order for us to be disciples of God, to truly love God, God is saying, I'm a jealous God. There cannot be anyone else. No one else. And un unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, 
It requires that time because you're going to make this decision. You're going to suffer. This is why the next verse he says, take up your cross. You will suffer. Now, he said one of my things is marriage counseling. I will never, let me say what I said. You know what I said? I will never, as far as I know, I know you're not supposed to never say never, but as far as my knowledge, I will never tell a couple in this situation to stay together. There was a, a, a Korean lady who was being abused by her husband, and he was constantly beating her up. He'll go dr be drunk, go home, get, use all, I mean, work, spend all the money, get drunk, come home, beat her and beat the children. All right? Beat her, beat the children. She came to her pastor, pastor, my husband's beating me. What should I do? Listen to what I said. Don't you t misunderstand what I'm saying? I would never say, go. Back to your husband. I'm not the old school pastor. I don't believe it that way. I'm so unfortunate. That part I don't believe. All right? I believe Jesus says, love your wife as you love yourself. If a person is beaten on their wife, beaten on their wife, they don't love themselves. And neither do they love God. All right? So they need to spend a lot of time with God and let God change them before they can ever come back to their wife. That's just me. All right? So they told, the pastor told them, same thing, similar to me. You have the right to leave. You have the right to leave. The lady, this little Asian lady sat down in the chair and said, and I'm not telling, condoning and telling anyone to do this, but I want you to understand, sometimes you have to bear that cross. Not sometimes. There, each of us have a different cross that we have to carry. Right? This Asian lady sat down and said, you know what? I know I have the right to leave, and I know I can leave. But for his salvation... If there's any chance, listen to what I'm saying. If there's any chance that my staying, he could, he could be saved, I will stay. But there's not going to be any more beaten anymore. There's a difference now. God calls us to be servants to each other, not doormats. Okay? She went home. She said, look, look here, listen here. This house belongs to Jesus Christ now. Okay, let me explain to you. This house, there's an Asian lady telling her husband, this house belongs to Jesus Christ now. One thing, you will not come home drunk anymore. Number two, you will never put your hands on me again. All right? All right? He laughed it off, whatever the case may be. Right? Came home drunk. Right? She said, she closed the door knowing he was drunk. He had to stay out the door. Right? Also, he tried to lift his hand on her. I told you I belong to Jesus now. Ah, okay, I don't, I don't, I don't hear it, whatever. She, though, kept praying for him. And she will sing hymns. She will sing songs in the house. And she kept praying, and she kept praying, and she's bearing this cross. She's being disgraced out in the street. He's cussing out in the street. He's all this thing. Do you know about two, three years later, the spirit moved on this man. He came home to his wife, bawling in tears. I'm so sorry. He apologized like all night long, crying to her. And he said, I want Jesus Christ. I am helpless. That man became baptized into the church. And up to this day, he has not struck her once nor even raised his voice. Both of them are safe in the kingdom of God. I'm not telling you, I'm not advocating for domestic violence. I'm not telling you to stay. But bearing your cross means suffering for the sake of somebody else's salvation at times. There are some parents in this room right now. I'm done. There are parents in this room right now whose children are in prison. Your son is in prison. Your daughter may be a lesbian or, or, or just doing all kind of stuff back and forth, a gangster in these streets. God is saying, look, what's your loyalty? Can you save them? No, you can't. Let them go. Come to me. And then I'm going to send you out to possibly save them. I will equip you and give you everything you need to bring them back. Oh, you don't believe it, do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you don't. No, you don't. You would have said amen or something. There are some of you in this room. 
are holding on to things you cannot change. You're holding on to your job. You're holding on to your career. You're holding on to that spouse who wants to leave. You're holding on to that child that does not want nothing to do with God. If two people are drowning, how can the other person help the other person? When did the blind start helping the blind? Jesus is saying, give it up. Surrender everything to me. Come to me. Let me equip you. Let me complete you. And then I will send you to them. And I will use you. And don't be surprised what I do with you. Your, 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 your husband left you. And now he's living with another woman. Let it go. Let him go. Don't even call him no more. Don't beg for him for nothing no more. Don't ask for alimony. Don't ask for nothing. Let him go. Come to me and don't be surprised. When I use you, you might be bringing him and his new wife and their children into the kingdom. Come on here. Come on here. Listen to me. You cannot do anything on your strength. You have no power in yourself. No power. Absolutely not. Jesus is saying, come to me now. And so some of you in closing, here we go, here we go. And some of you in closing, now I know I said to close about 10,000 times, but here we go, here we go, here we go. And some of you in closing say, Pastor, preacher, what am I going to get if I give up? What do I get in return? And Jesus said, I got some promises for you in the future. Revelation 2.7, you, you don't have to turn to it, but you can write it down. Revelation 2.7, he who have ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To him who overcomes, key word here, overcomes, it means you're going to go through something. I will give you eat from the tree of life. That's not enough for you. Revelation 2.11, to him who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. That's not enough for you. I got more. Revelation 2.17, to him who overcomes, I will give him the hidden manner and give him a new name that I will write on a white stone. That's not enough for you. Revelation 2, 26. And he who overcomes and keeps my words until the end, I will give him power over all nations. Oh, that's not enough for you. I hear you too quiet in here. Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garment and shall be not be blotted out from the book of life. And he will be confessed before the angels and before God. That's not enough for you. Revelation 3.12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar into the temple of God. And he shall not, no more, ever be removed. Yeah. All right, that's not, still not enough for you. Revelation 3.21. He who overcomes, I will grant him a seat with me on my throne. When Jesus says, give it up, you know the question you should ask Jesus? Jesus, how big is your throne? Do you have room for me? He said, he who overcomes, I will give a seat next to me on my throne. That's not good enough for you. Revelation 21, 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. How much things? When you let it go, God is going to give it back to you a hundredfold. Some of you 200 folds. Some of you a few thousand folds. Some of you a few million folds. What you let go today for God, you will get back a million times more. Oh, you're not happy about that. I got something for you for right now. Romans chapter 15 says, if for right now, for those of you who said, but God, I need something right now, something tangible, says if, if, if for doing the, you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. Wherefore, some of you don't know where your daddy's name is. Some of you have never met your daddy. But God is saying, I got a daddy for you. Daddy, I'm a father. You can call God father and he will call you his son and his daughter. That's not good enough for you. Romans 8, 15. God says, I'm going to give you a new identity. 
and so much, you'll be doing greater works than I was doing. That's not good enough for you? Romans 15, 14, 12. Jesus says, listen to me. I have come that they may have life and have it more what? Abundantly. Abundantly. You have more time in your 24 hours. Everybody else who's living in sin is limited to 24 hours. In your 24 hours, your life will be more abundant. But I see you, and that's not good enough for you. Jesus says, those of you who come in, came in here broken-minded, John 14, 27, weeping, no, Psalms 35, weeping may endure for a night. But joy, unquenching joy, unremovable joy, nonstop joy, joy will come when? In the morning. Psalms 35. It says joy will come in the morning. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to behave myself. No, no, ain't no more taking time. I'm done. I got to let it go. I got to let it go. I got to let it go. This is an illustration. Could you play something as we close? It's an il illustration. There's two born animals, a cow and a hen. And they heard about that the church was in need of help. The hen looked to the cow and said, look, I got a great idea. We can feed, we can feed the people at the church. It's imagination now, it's imagination, but it's to help you understand. We can feed the people at the church. The hen said, look, I will give my eggs. You give your steaks. The cow said, can you say that again? I will give eggs. This is the hen speaking. But you, the cow, give steaks. It says, run that by me one more time. Take your, take your time with it, too. Don't, don't rush it. Take your time with it. Do like the preacher. Take your time with it. I will give my eggs and I will contribute I'll give my eggs whatever how many more amount of eggs they need I'm willing to give it I'll give my eggs but you give your steak remember it's imagination the cow turns to him and says here's my only problem with that your eggs are a contribution. My stake requires a commitment. God is not looking for eggs from you. He's not looking for your contributions. This is why, this is why the woman, the lady, the lady with the, with the, 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 the widow, when she came into the temple and she had her two mites, her two pennies left, Jesus was blown away. Jesus was blown away. He said, this lady has given more than everybody else. The disciples were puzzled, of course. They didn't understand. Jesus said, because this lady gave what? Her all. She didn't contribute. She committed herself. El El Elijah went to a lady's house, another widow. It's always somebody in a, a bind, yeah. You know, it's never a rich person. You never, you never, you know, you ever notice when you read the Bible and somebody has to give up? It's never like somebody who's comfortable and just, because God wants to make a point. Elijah goes to this widow's house and she's in a bind. There's a famine in the land. She has no husband. And he's rude and arrogant. If Pastor Reed did what Elijah did, 
Some of you would close the door on him, to be honest. But Elijah saw her making food and said, give me that. And she said, all we have is some measure of wheat and a drop of oil. I'm going to make one more cake, one more bread, and my son and I are going to eat it. And then we're going to what? Elijah looks to the lady and said, give that to me. When I read it, there was not one portion where it says that she paused or hesitated. She didn't hesitate. She turns it over to him. And then he said, God is going to bless you. You will never have an empty jar of oil. And your flour will continue overflowing. If that lady was still alive today, that flower will still be overflowing. That oil will be still be flowing out. Listen to me. If you didn't hear anything we said today, in the song, the scripture, the prayer, simply this. God is not delighted in your contribution. Members contribute. I've donated to the church. The fan, I contributed to that. The equipment, you know, that, that thing is distracting. I was there looking at myself the whole time. Looking at myself. <laughs> Somebody contributed. Contributed. Excuse me. Contributed. Sorry. Contributed to that. Contributed to the fans. Contribute to this. Contribute. Contribute. As a matter of fact, some of you even contribute to Bible work. I got two hours this week. I can, I can give us some time. Not, God is not impressed at all. You know what impressed God? Faith. Faith. Faith impressed God. God wants some of us in this room to say to the boss, you know what, boss? I'm going to take a few days. There's some people in my church's community or my community that need to see Jesus. Now, whether I'm going to go and preach or get Bible study or hand out sandwiches or help fix their house, but I'm going to go and give myself to Jesus. There are some of you, maybe in a relationship right now, about to get married. Now, I want to blow anybody's fuse here. About to get married. But you know that God has put in your heart, that's not the one I'm sending for you. I know you want somebody to be with. I know you want somebody to complete you. Don't do that. Let me complete you. Let me complete you. Let him go. Let her go. Some of you right now are contemplating where you're going to put this investment in. Am I going to put this in a mutual fund or a stock, or buy another house, or do this? And you see the Sabbath school lesson, and it says mission field, mission field, mission field, every quarter. And God has put on your heart. I need to get rid of this money. Let it go. Send it to the mission field. Send it out to the mission field so the gospel can be preached in all this world. Do an eternal life investment. I'm telling you, when you surrender and give to God, when you commit to God, when you commit everything, not contribute, not contribute, not none of that. But rather, commit. The words of a song said, I give myself away so that you can do what? Why we sing that? I give myself away so that you can use me.
Who here today? Who's not worried about what anyone else thinks? It's not concerned. Who, like the disciples, will say, Look, Lord, there is nothing in this world, not husband, not wife, not even children, that will keep me from giving myself completely to you. Pastor Reed. This appeal is not your general appeal of rededication. Mm -mm. No, no, no. As I said, God is not impressed with your contribution. Keep singing. God is tired of us playing members and playing church. He wants to make us his disciples. Go. Make disciples of men. Not members. This is only for those who have said, look, I've been holding on to this. I've been holding on to career. I've been holding on to my future plans. I've been holding on to this relationship. I've been holding on to this and this. It is time I let it go. It's going to burn anyway. Jesus is simply saying, will you give yourself to him today? If that's your commitment, if that's your decision, and you, uh, some of us, be honest with ourselves, God, I don't even have the strength to say, I want to do that. I need your strength. If you want the strength that only God can give, and you want to commit your life to Jesus Christ completely so he can use you, I'm asking you, the very few, just please stand. Amen. The rest of you, I'm asking you to pray for these individuals. I'm asking you to pray for your brothers and sisters you see standing up who are determined that says, look, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather have Jesus than the happinesses of this world. The power, the greed. I'd rather have Jesus than fine clothes and fine dining. I'd rather have Jesus than everything. As a matter of fact, I'd rather have Jesus than even my life. Lay that altar. Now, those of you who are stood, I'm going to ask your pastor to pray over you. I want you to make even a bolder move. Remember, it said commitment here, not contribution. Uh -uh. Commitment, and God is watching. This is why it's not for everybody. Some of you are not ready. Be honest with yourself. I'm not ready yet. But I'm warning you, alert, alert, alert. You see the signs. Those of you who are standing, I'm asking you to come on down. The pastor's. As Pastor Reed prays, myself and the other pastors will be praying over you because this is a commitment. And the final one, the final one before he prays. We wa want to extend an invitation to somebody in this room who has never given their life to Jesus Christ before. You heard the message, but when you compare what's out there in the world to what Jesus has to offer or who Jesus is, you say, look, look, I don't care about all the logistics. I just want Jesus. If that is you, and you want Bible studies, and you want to prepare to be baptized, you want to even go bolder and put everything on the altar, I'm asking you to raise your hand. You've never given your life to Jesus. 
and you want to make a bold move for him, I you raise your hand. So you know what this means. Everyone in this room is saved then. If there's no one to give their life to Jesus, that means everyone in this room is saved. So then we're not doing our job. Jesus. Disciples go and make disciples. Amen. Disciples go and make disciples. For too long we've been members, myself included. Don't think, oh, I'm preaching to you. No, no, I'm preaching to myself first. You're only getting the residue. For too long we've been members. Jesus wants us to be disciples. I pray that one day when I visit again, there are people in here because you are determined to be everything for Jesus and make disciples of men. Amen. Pastor. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you today. Lord, thanking you for calling us to such a close and intimate relationship with you. A relationship that calls us to relinquish everything. Yes even our own life. Lord, may we not see any of these things as a loss, but see it, but see our relationship with you as one that is a gain. May we be like those individuals who found the hidden treasure in the field who went and sold everything. Yes, yes. So because they saw just how much that treasure was worth. May we see you as a treasure, oh God. Open our eyes that we may come to know the beauty and the wonder of who you are and your incredible love for us. Lord, we've come here today. We're standing at the altar for we recognize that there are some things in our lives that causes our hearts to be divided. Many of us have divided loyalties. We, are, we put our friends, our family before you, what they think about us. We even put our own desires and dreams before your will. And so, Lord, we ask that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse us, but that you would cause us, like Paul saw it, as all but dung yes. for the excellency of seeing and knowing your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we stand here today with our hearts open, making a decision to walk with you all the way, to put everything on the altar, to be radical disciples for you. And, Lord, may our life be an aroma of your grace so that others who don't know you will be drawn to you because we know you and we represent you. And so, Lord, I pray for every person today that's standing here. May they give everything to you. May we give our all, yes. our life please, please, to please, you. Lord, please help us. Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God may be seated. Thank you. God bless you. Return to your seats. Amen. thank God for this service. We thank him for healing. We thank him for salvation. We thank him for redemption. Thank him for the pastor and the spoken word. Lord, help that we will become disciples. Thank you, Jesus. And now, as we leave this sanctuary, as we go our separate ways, may God favor be upon you. May he cover you with his grace. I will keep praying for you. Please keep praying for me. May God keep us all in the palm of his hand until we are together again. Be blessed. Go with Christ. Amen. <laughs>